So we are moving on in this teaching series called I Am, and it's based out of the Gospel of John. Now, there are many things that make the Gospel of John unique. Uh, One of them is that in the Gospel of John, and really only in the Gospel of John, do we find all of these I Am statements from Jesus. And each statement is specifically designed to help us kind of see a, a different angle uh, of Jesus, kind of something unique in him and in his character. And so, so far in this series, out of John's gospel, we've heard things uh, that Jesus was saying, like, before Abraham was, I am, which is grammatically wrong. Like, right? Like, it doesn't even make, make sense, but Jesus here wasn't trying to make grammatical sense. What he was doing was he He took the personal self-description of God given to Moses in the burning bush, the great I am, that I am that I am, I yah, should I yah. And and what he does, he says, yeah, I'm him. I was the God in the burning bush. That was week one. In week two, uh, we heard Jesus say, I am the bread of life. He said, I am an endless supply of everything you will ever need. All right, he's come not just to fill our bellies, but to fill up our souls. And and I love the picture. He's not just that he's the bread of life, but he says that if you eat from me, you will never hunger again. Right? So last week, it's like a 24-7 buffet, right? Every time we feel that ache, that that thirst, we feel that thing inside, Jesus saying, "I'm, I'm here. Come eat from me. So that was week one. That was week two. Today, why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8 as we look at the next I am statement of Jesus. I'll read it right here. John 8 verse 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I'm going to read that one more time. Jesus spoke again to the people and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you're taking notes this morning, here is the I am statement from Jesus. He says, I am the light of the world. Now, if you're uh, new to my teaching, something that we kind of focus on often here is not just what the Bible says, but why the Bible says what it says. So whenever we come uh, to a text, you kind of have to understand the context, uh, the setting. So here, it's beautiful words that Jesus just spoke, but the question is, why did he speak these words? Well, here's what's important for you to understand. If you go to the beginning of John chapter 8, what it will actually say is that this scene kind of all happened the day after the Feast of Tabernacles. So there was in uh, the, the custom of the Hebrew people, they would take one week out every single year to celebrate what was called the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a one-week celebration of uh, the Exodus account. So you, you think about like God delivering uh, the Hebrews out of Egypt and then getting them into the Promised Land. They had one week every year that was set aside to remember that. And they would do all of these really interesting things throughout the week to remember that. They, they, they would actually build makeshift homes. And the people for that entire week would live in like tents and, and like made with like wood framing. And, and, and they would do this to remember that during the 40 years in the wilderness, how they lived in temporary dwellings. They would take water from the pool of Siloam and they would pour it out to, to remember when God brought forth water from a rock. But, but maybe one of the most spectacular things that they did during this week uh, was in the Temple Tech team. If you can just turn on my fire here. If you were here two weeks ago, <laughs> you'll know how happy I am that that just turned on. <laughs> That's... Uh, um, the temple, you ever been to Jerusalem before, what you'll know is that the temple kind of sits on the highest point. So kind of wherever you are, you can look up and you can see the temple. Well, what they did during the Feast of Tabernacles was they made these very large, I mean, this is the poor man's prop right here, like this, but it'll somewhat get the picture. 
these would have been 75 feet in the air. That went right up. And then at the top, they would have these four towers of fire. And at the top, uh, they would be like oil lanterns that would burn really, really bright. So no matter where you were in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, all you had to do was look up and you could see the fire. And the fire symbolized when the Hebrews, the Israelites were in the wilderness, that it says that God came down as a pillar of fire and led them at night through the dark. It says that the pillar of fire came and and what would happen is they wouldn't know where to go. So the pillar goes in front of them and would lead them every single step of the way. So for a week, every single year, the fires would, would blaze and they would look up and they would remember God coming down in that pillar of fire to lead them through the darkness. So here it is. It's the day after the Feast of Tabernacles. The people have just spent an entire week staring at the fire, remembering the Exodus story. And John's gospel tells us that it's the morning after the celebration ended and Jesus is actually standing in the very place where the fire stood. And it's here that he makes the claim, I am the light of the world. What he's actually saying to them is, hey, guys, I want to connect the dots for you. He's, He's saying that that fire that led your ancestors through the darkness long ago is actually standing in front of you right now. He's saying, I'm the one who's actually come. I am the true light of the world who's come to illuminate the path in front of you. Now, what's interesting is that for the Hebrew people, whenever they would talk about light and darkness, this was a very vivid thing for them. Like, like this was ingrained in their mind. And it actually, it didn't even start in the Exodus story, what we're, us up here. It went much further back than that. The whole light and darkness thing started in the very beginning of creation. We're in John 8. Turn with me over for a moment to the very beginning of your Bible. Genesis 1, verse 1. I want to read for you the very first words of our entire scripture. Listen to this. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Light. Oh, I love this. A couple things. Number one, the first thing that God spoke over his creation was light, which is beautiful, right? Because without it, you have nothing else. But that's not the only thing I want you to see. Really, what I want you to see out of Genesis is the state of the world before light came in. Three things. It says that the, the world was formless, empty, and dark. And I just believe that that's not just a picture of what creation was like before the light came in, but it's also a picture of what we were like before Jesus came in. Formless, empty, dark. Let me explain these, okay? First, formless, formless. You you know what's really interesting? Um, The very first Christians weren't called Christians at all. Uh, they were actually called followers of the way, which I, I just, I, I like that, right? But the idea was that there is, there is a fully formed way of living for the follower of Jesus. Like, like, like there, there, there's shape to it. There's structure to it. And, and I love it. It's actually beautifully spoken of in the Westminster Catechism when it says this, that the chief end of man, the purpose of it all, is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. You want to know the purpose of your life? It is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. God wants you to enjoy him. And the more that you enjoy him, the more that you will glorify him. And the more that you glorify him, the more that your formless state begins to be transformed into the image of Jesus himself we actually become more like him. 
But please make no mistake, before Jesus came in, the picture is that we are without form. We are, we are not being formed the way that God wants us to be. We, we the clay, have not let the potter begin to mold us. You see the picture? We're formless. But not just formless. It also says that in the beginning of creation that the world was empty. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I pretty much preached an entire sermon last week on this point. But, oh, at times, at times, if we're honest, right, we just feel this profound sense of emptiness inside. It's like there's an ache And what that ache does is it causes us, humanity, to try to self-medicate. Because all we want to do when we feel that emptiness, when we feel that ache, is we want to to turn to something to numb it. So some turn to the bottle, others turn to pills, some turn to sex, others to luxury items or promotions. For, For some, honestly, it's Netflix. And what we do is we feel that, right? So we're just like, oh, well, that feels uncomfortable. So all we're trying to do is numb it with something we're self-medicating. Why? Because there's this emptiness that we feel, right? So it's formless. It's empty. And the third thing is this, that it says that it was dark. Now, just to kind of give you a heads up, in just a moment from now, the lights are going to turn off. And I just don't want anyone to be afraid. But before God said, let there be light, it was dark. This right here, this right here is a picture, not just of what creation was like before God spoke, but this is a, This is a picture of what life is like before Jesus came in. Dark. And you want to know what one of the scariest things about being in the dark is? Is how fast your eyes begin to adjust. The longer you spend in the dark, well, interestingly, it just doesn't feel that dark anymore. All of a sudden, things that you couldn't see, you give it enough time, and all of a sudden, they begin to take shape. And, and maybe the scary reality, the scariest reality, is that maybe there's people listening to my voice right now who you genuinely think that you're walking in the light, but all that's happened is your eyes have adjusted to the dark around you, so much so that you can't even tell the difference anymore. This is, I want you to see this. In the beginning, the world was formless, empty, dark. Before Christ came in, we were formless, empty, and dark. But then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Welcome to Parkwood, immersive sermons. (laughs) (laughs) And when the light stepped in, all of a sudden that which was formless began to take shape. All of a sudden when the light stepped in, that which was empty began to be filled. All of a sudden that that which was dark began to shine. (laughs) Like you have to understand this is what God wants to do. He wants to shine. It's Colossians who actually tells us that Jesus was was the the author of creation itself. So that moment, you go back to that very moment, right? In the beginning, let there be light. Who's involved in that? Jesus. Hundreds upon hundreds of years later, John 8. Who's the guy who stands at the same place where the fires? He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks with me will never walk in darkness again. It's so beautiful. Listen, this is what 
God wants to do. This is what Jesus, this is his heart's intent, is to light up the dark for us. Go back with me over to John 8. So we were in John 8. We went to Genesis 1. Go back to John 8 again. So get the setting. It's the morning after the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus is standing in the very location where these large, massive pillars would have stood and the fire would have symbolized that, that pillar of fire in the wilderness with the Israelites. But John's gospel actually tells us that before Jesus stood and said, I am the light of the world, something else happened first. Early that morning, really early in the morning, what happened was the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, they caught a woman in the very act of adultery. Now, Listen, this is bad back then. It's bad today. It's bad. Like, like if you're sleeping around with somebody else and you get caught by like an email or something, that's bad. Think about this. She was caught in the very act. Okay, this is embarrassing to, 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 put, to put it nicely. So what the Pharisees do is they, they, they drag her out of bed. They drag her down the street, parading her in front of everybody. And they bring her to the place where Jesus was in the temple courts. And they say, Jesus, this woman was caught in, by by, by being an adulteress, she was actually caught in the very act. And the law of Moses says that she should be stoned to death. What do you say, Jesus? Now, just to be clear, being stoned to death doesn't mean smoking marijuana until you die. Okay? (laughs) Um... It's much worse than that. It's where they would pick up rocks and they would throw it at your head until you died. It is a brutal, brutal way to go. They drag this woman in front of Jesus and when I think of somebody who's formless and empty, and dark, someone who's trying to self-medicate and numb that feeling. I think of this woman. She's brought right down in front of Jesus. Jesus, tell us, what do we do? And so Jesus does a really interesting thing. He bends down and starts writing in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote. I, I've read a lot of speculation on this. Something I was reading this week said that Jesus maybe was writing the sins of the Pharisees in the dirt. I don't know. We we have no clue. Maybe he was drawing a picture. I I, I don't know. Um, But the longer he wrote in the dirt, this began to agitate the Pharisees even more. So they said, Jesus, the law, the law says she deserves death. What do you say? Jesus looks at her. He looks at them. Stands up and says, whoever among you has never sinned before, you can be the first to throw a stone. He's saying, all right, if any of you Pharisees have never broken the law, throw away, be my guest. And it says, one by one, they dropped their stones and walked away. Jesus looks at this woman and says, does anyone condemn you? She looks around and says, no one. Lord, I love that. It's not no one, sir, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then, the very next thing Jesus said is, I am the light of the world. He's saying, just like at the beginning with creation, when it was formless and when it was empty and when it was dark, just like back then, just like when the pillar of fire came to invade the darkness and the wilderness with the Israelites, he said, I'm here now. I am the light of the world. I'm the one who's come to invade your life in your darkest moment, in your most empty moment, when you were formless. I show up. Like, this is good news. You see, when, when, when Jesus said this to that woman, you got to think about it. Uh, when he said, neither do I condemn you, 
in that moment, Jesus didn't just become the light of the world, he became the light of her world. And the good news of Jesus is that he is still lighting up dark places. Like he is. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know who you really I'm even speaking to right now. But my guess is that there's some people here that you just know that you're walking in darkness this morning. And I don't even need to convince you who you are. The chances are the Spirit's been kind of tugging on your heart in some ways here. You walk in darkness, and it's kind of funny in some senses. Well, it's more sad that we we try to convince ourselves that God doesn't know (laughs) what we're going through. Can, Can I just tell you right now, like, He knows? Your, your wife may not know, but he knows. Your husband doesn't know, but he knows. Your kids may not know, but he knows. Your pastor may not know, but he knows. Why? Because he is the light of the world. There is not one square inch in this universe where his light does not shine in. He knows. It's like we just have to acknowledge that this morning. He knows. And what he's looking for is a people who will just turn and will say, all right, Jesus, so if you know everything, and in you nothing is hidden, and in you is only light and life, then then really what Jesus is after is a people who will just say, God, I surrender. Lord, would you fill me? Would you form me? Would you light up the path so I can begin to walk in my purpose? He's waiting, wanting, desiring a people who will let the light in. And here's the really interesting thing about Jesus in this sermon this morning, is that when we get to that point, and I'm not talking about religiously conforming. I'm talking about when you get to the place of surrender in your life, and you just say, God, I'm done. I'm done doing it my way. I need you, the light of the world, to help, to fill. When you get to that spot, it's really interesting that that we actually become the light of God as well. Not in the same way that he is, but we become the light. L- listen, so in John 8, right here, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Well, I want to take you to another passage as we begin to kind of ramp this down. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Listen to what Jesus says here. He says, you are the light of the world. So which one is it, Jesus? Is it you Or is it me? Yes. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay. Let me talk about this. This is fun. Jesus right here, he doesn't just tell us that we are the light of the world. He tells us exactly what type of light we are. And he doesn't say, you're the sun, you're a star. No, 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 no. He says this. Look at verse 15. He says, you're a lamp. You know what's interesting about lamps? Lamps, lamps don't produce light. All they can do is hold light. At their best, that's all they they, they can do. They they, they can just hold something that's put into them. Jesus here says, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine for others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Listen, listen, we are the light of the world, but not in the same way that Jesus is, okay? Jesus is pure light. Jesus is the source of light. And you and I, we become the light of the world only when we become lit by him first. 
only. You, you know, I, I don't know if this is a good example, but I was thinking about this this week. When I was probably around 10 years old, this is like 30 years ago, I don't know if these things are still popular uh, today, but uh, they were these stickers that you would put on your ceiling. And it would be like stars and galaxies, and they were really cool. And uh, so I went out and, well, I didn't buy them. I probably begged my parents to buy them for me. And I remember I covered my entire ceiling in these glow-in-the-dark stickers. And then when you turned your light off, it was amazing, honestly, because you just lay there, and it's, it's like your ceiling's not even there. It's like you're staring out into space, and you can see everything. The only problem was it only lasted for about 20 minutes, maybe 30. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they would dim out and go away, and it was dark again. Why? because they're not actual stars. It's not actually space on my ceiling <laughs> that I'm looking at. It's, it's stickers that by design are supposed to absorb the light around it. So that way, when the lights go off and it's dark, what it can do is it can take what has been put inside of it and it can shine it out for a temporary period of time. You see, this, this is kind of what this relationship with Jesus is like. You see, what Jesus is doing is he's, he, he's actually calling us to live in this way that, that the more time we spend with him, the more his light comes into us like a lamp. And the more time we spend in his presence, the more time his light comes in, the more that we begin to glow and reflect what he has actually put into us. Like Parker, God wants his church to shine. Knowing full well that the only way that we can do it is by running to him first. Like this is, this is God's way of leveraging everything in his, in his advantage. Because the only way that we can actually become the light of the world is by first getting consumed with the true light, the source. You know, you think of uh, in the Exodus story, we're talking about that this morning a little bit. There's this one story where Moses went up on the mountain and he spent like a prolonged period of time in the very presence of God. And he came down the mountain and he didn't even know it, but his face was shining, just like shining. And it kind of scared people. They didn't know what to do with it, right? And, 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 and although I don't, I don't think that's something that necessarily is gonna happen if you just sing a worship song, but, but the picture there I, I think is amazing that the more time we spend with God, the more his presence, his light fills us, comes on us, and the more that we will reflect his glory to the world around us. And I just know that like as we're closing, there's probably somebody here today or online just thinking, Pastor, I don't know. Like, I love Jesus. I'm trying to do my best to follow Jesus. But surely there's somebody more qualified than me to shine his light in dark places. And friend, I just want to remind you right now that God is in the business of calling the most unqualified people to accomplish his perfect plans. You want me to run through the list? I'll run through the list. Oddly, I hope this encourages you, okay? Noah had issues with alcohol. Abraham was way too old to be having babies. He was like 100. Jacob was a liar. Gideon was afraid. Moses had a stutter and he murdered somebody. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair. Martha worried about everything. Zacchaeus apparently was too short. The disciples, they just keep falling asleep on Jesus. Peter was impulsive, a know-it-all, and at times violent. But it was this unqualified mess of people who said, all right, God, I'm done doing it my own way. I surrender to you. 
God, would you fill what is empty in me? Would you form me into your image? God, would you light a path so that I could walk on? God, would you let your light in so I can shine your light out? Jesus is the light of the world. Please stand on up. I think one of the things that we struggle with from time to time is we think that God is looking for a perfect people. And when he finds that perfect person that is without sin and never falters and never stumbles, then that's the person that God wants to use. Can I tell you that is just not the case. God's not looking for the perfect person. He's looking for the open person. He's looking for the person that Eat, that acknowledges, yeah, I have good days, bad days. Sometimes I make mistakes. God, I need you. Lord, would you let your light in? That's what God's looking for. That's what God's looking for, for a people who will say, God, I can't see a step in front of me. It's just dark. I don't know where to go. God, I need your light because light gives way to sight. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would light up my path so that I no longer walk in darkness. And, and when we come with that attitude, man, Jesus is the promise keeper. Like we sang, right? Like he's gonna come. He's gonna dwell. And he's gonna take the lamps of our life and he's gonna light them up. And it doesn't mean that you're never gonna stumble again. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna have hard days, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna have the light of life walking with you, abiding in you, and leading you every step. So if you feel empty, let the light in. If you're walking in darkness, let the light in. If if you don't know up from down or left from right, you don't know how to walk forward, let the light in. Let the light in. This is our God.